Verse number 1, 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 1, the Bible says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse number 2 is what I want to focus on. It says this, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The title of the sermon this morning is God's style of preaching. God's style of preaching. I'm going to be going through the Bible and looking at God's word, looking at the commands that are given to preachers, looking at the style of preaching that we see coming from the apostles, coming from the prophets. Look at the style of preaching that we see coming from God himself. And we're going to look at every aspect of it. We want to look at all of the different styles of preaching, you know, in our minds, just kind of reflecting back on what we've seen. And we want to figure out what is the correct style of preaching. Everything as far as practicality within the church, even almost everything outside of the church, is given to us in the Word of God. So even the preaching that we hear, the style of preaching, the delivery, everything should line up with the Word of God. So we're going to go through different elements. The very first one that I want to point out to you is found there in verse number two. This is the most important element of what style of preaching, of what type of preaching, how a preacher should preach. Look what it says, the very first three words in verse number two. It says this, preach the Word. Now this is not just Paul's opinion. This is God using Paul as an instrument and speaking through him and giving a commandment to a preacher. If you look there in verse number one, he says, I charge thee therefore before God. This is inspired scripture. This is God himself giving a command of how a preacher is supposed to preach. What a preacher is supposed to preach. And what does he tell him? It says, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Talking about preach the Word of God. When a preacher stands up, he should be preaching scripture. When a preacher stands up behind the pulpit, when a pastor gets up, an evangelist gets up, a missionary gets up, when anyone is preaching at all, a preacher should be preaching the word. You know what that means is he shouldn't be preaching his own opinions. He shouldn't be preaching just his own personal beliefs. There should never be a time when a pastor, when a preacher stands up behind the pulpit and then he just starts preaching things that he has come up with on his own. Just it's all based upon his own personal beliefs. It should always be founded upon the word of God and he should be preaching the word of God. The next point that I want to focus on, and this is even more rare today, uh, is this. It says, preach the word. It says, be instant in season, out of season. So that means when it's popular, when something's in season, and then it says, and out of season, or just out of season. That means when it's not popular, when someone doesn't want to hear it. Look at how it's followed up afterwards. It says this, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering." and doctrine. So right there he kind of gives an explanation of how you are going to preach the word and what's actually going to be happening, what's going to be taking place while you are preaching the word. A couple of different things it says this, it says reprove. Now what, is, what does it mean to reprove someone? It means to correct somebody, doesn't it? It means to correct a person. That's what it means to reprove them, it means you are correcting them. It's kind of a lighter correction, right? Then it says this, rebuke. Now rebuke is, it's a hard correction. That's when you are correcting someone very strongly or it's a hard type of correction. Are those first two things positive or negative? The very first two things on the list. They would be negative, wouldn't they? Reprove, that's negative. You know, you, it would be a negative message. That would be considered a negative message that you are giving to the person. To reprove them, same thing with rebuke. Reprove, rebuke, and then it says this, exhort. Now what does it mean to exhort? It means to uplift somebody, right? It's That's something positive. So if we look at what is being spoken of here, when it says preach the word and he gives a breakdown or an explanation of what in what way you are supposed to preach the word, he says that one way is you're going to be reproving people. What's that mean? You're going to be correcting people. Lighter correction, right? Another way is you're going to be rebuking people. What is that? That's a, that's a harder correction. That's a much more stern, stronger correction. And then the last one is exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So there is supposed to be positivity in preaching, isn't there? 
There's supposed to be times where we're exhorting. There's supposed to be times where a preacher stands up and he edifies, where he uplifts. Exhort means to kind of push someone or encourage them uh, 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 primarily. It means to get them to do more than what they are doing right now. That's what it means to exhort. If you're exhorting someone, you are encouraging them to do more. But what I want to focus on in what is lacking today in preaching, this is the next point. Number one, it was preach the word. The second point is negativity. There is a lot of negative things. We need to be preaching the full content of the Bible, the positive and the negative. Now, if we look at the majority of preaching that goes from the pulpit today, is it positive or is it negative? It would be positive. It would be almost entirely positive. I know that I've experienced this in a lot of the churches that I've sit in, a lot of the preaching that I've just listened to, is that the majority of what you hear when you're, when you're hearing or listening to preaching is what? It's just almost all positive, isn't it? It's just positive constantly. If we look at this list of what a preacher is commanded to preach, two-thirds of it is negative. The majority of it is negative. We look at the Bible in its entirety, the messages of prophets, apostles, preachers, Jesus Christ himself. Were they majority? Were they preaching? Would you say that, that most of what they preached was positive or would you say that most of what they preached was negative? So the majority of what they were preaching is negative. We look at God's message that he gives. The majority of the Bible in general, is it positive or is it negative? It's by far the majority of it is negative. Why? Because we're sinners. Because what we need in our lives, all of us, what we need the most is we need correction. We need to be directed. We need to be told that, hey, you need to stop doing this. Because we have, you know, uh, obviously always will and do now sin in our lives. Even until the de the, our, our day of death, our last breath, we will have sin in our lives. So we're going to need to constantly be corrected for that sin. So... Number one, preach the word. We need to be preaching the Bible. We need to not be preaching our opinions. We need to not be preaching our own philosophies, our own way of thinking. If you write a sermon, if you ever write down a sermon, if you ever come up with a message, if you ever have points, you know, all of those points need to be derived from Scripture. All of those, you know, lessons or whatever you're teaching, all of those principles of that sermon, the, the, the skeletal structure of that sermon, it needs to be based upon Scripture. You need to be preaching the Word. Number two is negative preaching. There needs to be a lot of negative preaching. Now, that may sound wild and crazy. It may even, you know, somebody may think, well, you know, that just sounds a little bit radical. That's because... You know, these, uh, these people are, are polarized to that. It's radical to them because they have a misunderstanding of what the Bible teaches. Right here, a commandment is plainly given to preach the Word. There's three different types of ways that they are to preach the Word or, or what's going to be going on while they're preaching the Word. Two out of three are negative. The majority of the Bible is negative. The majority of the preaching all throughout the Bible is negative. I want you to notice that it says... Preach the word, and then it says instant, be instant, in season and out of season. Why is that in there? You ever stop and think that, why did Paul feel it necessary after he gives a commandment to them, or to particularly Timothy, why did he feel it necessary to tell him, hey, be instant, in season and out of season? Why would he feel it necessary for him to follow up, hey, preach the word instant, in season, be instant, in season, and out of season. What does it mean to be instant? It means to be ready, right? And like I said, in season, like if you were to you know, think of something in, that is in season, you normally would think of fashion. What does that mean? It means it's popular, right? If something is in season, it's, it's a clothing or something normally, or shoes or something, you'd say, hey, that's, that's in season, right? That means it's popular. But what if it's out of season? It means it's not popular, right? That means that it's not popular. You know what that tells me? That, in, you know, that he felt it so necessary to follow up the statement, preach the word, or the commandment, preach the word, with be instant in, in season and out of season. That tells me that there's going to be a lot of times when people do not like what you're preaching. That tells me that it's going to be important to encourage the preacher to preach even when it's popular and even when it's not. Now, what types of messages are going to be not popular? What types of messages are people not going to want to hear? Do you, think, do you think that people are going to want to hear things that are positive or negative? What do people desire to hear? Positive messages. What churches are just packed 
full. What churches grow the fastest? What, just in general, of all Christendom, what churches do just people just flooding the seats and the pews? What types of churches? Where the pastor stands up and what does he do? He just tells people what they want to hear. Look at verse number three. So first there we saw preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Talks about some positive and, and majority negative ways that you're going to be preaching. Now look at verse number three. For the time will come when they will not, look at this, endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What types of things do you think that those teachers are going to be teaching to them? What types of messages do you think that they're going to be hearing? What types of messages do you think that they don't want to hear? Maybe the reproofs. Maybe that's what Paul is talking about to Timothy. Maybe he's saying, hey, there's going to be a time when people are going to come when they're not going to want to endure sound doctrine, but they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What types of preachers and teachers do you think are going to be teaching? It's the ones that are only doing one third of what they were commanded. It's pastors that are standing up. You know what they're doing? They're just exhorting every single week. What do people desire to hear? Do you think the majority of people that are Christians want to go and listen to someone reprove and rebuke them? Do you think people desire that? Of course not. In our flesh, we would, we would hate that. Of course, our pride would, would oppose that and push that back, right? But you know what we need as Christians? You know what we need from now until the day that we die? We need to be corrected by God's Word. Why? Because we're sinners. And we're always going to be sinners and we're always going to have sin in our lives. Sound doctrine, sound doctrine oftentimes is being corrected. You know, we think of, you know, doctrine and we think, oh, it's just, you know, deep teachings on the book of Revelation and things like that. No, no, sound doctrine, uh, right here when this is referring to sound doctrine, it's talking about being reproved and it's talking about being rebuked and, of course, exhorting. Now, what do the majority of preachers preach today? They preach positive only messages. You say, why would a sermon like this be important to figure out what God's style of preaching is? What, what, what style of preaching does God desire the preacher to preach? Why would something like this be so important? It's because there is a famine today when it comes to Bible preaching, to God's style of preaching. When I looked up on the internet, I looked up some specific things on the internet of what people like to hear, what types of preaching people like to hear. And there was a few different things that people said specifically that they don't like while attending church. And one of them, do you know what it was? Specifically, and these are on Christian websites, not being corrected all the time. That was one of the things that people said repeatedly on mainstream Christian websites and forums. And, and there was articles that were written, and I read, I think, three of them total. And you know what they kept saying? We don't like being corrected constantly. They use words like, we don't like being bashed. I don't go to church just to be bashed the entire time. That is what a pastor is commanded to do. Now, they want to, of course, try to demonize it by using the word, you know, bash. But what a pastor is commanded to do is to stand up and to preach the word of God. My job is not to try to find out the individual problems and to stand up here and just preach against, you know, individuals. But my job is to preach the word. And it is from Genesis to Revelation. And it is when it's popular and when it's not popular. And it is to reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That is the job of a pastor, whether you like it or whether you don't. And I am going to preach the Bible whether you like it or whether you don't. And I don't care whether your doctrine changes. I don't care whether you believe something different. I don't care whether you change what you believe. I'm still going to preach what the Bible teaches. I'm still going to preach Bible doctrine. That's what a pastor is commanded to do. You know, it's easy for someone when, when, you know, when they're at a church and they're attending a church particularly a pastor, and let's say that people start to change their doctrine. People start to change and maybe liberalize where, you know, they, they don't want to hear certain styles of preaching. They don't want to hear, you know, they don't want to be preached at. They don't want to hear sound doctrine. They don't believe whatever you believe. It's easy for the pastor to fold. Let's say that people don't believe in tithing anymore. That's a, a, the reason why I, I attended a church where, you know, the pastor believed in tithing, but nobody in the congregation virtually believed in tithing. Some of them tithed anyways, but they didn't believe in the doctrine specifically. Almost no one in the church believed in tithing, and the pastor would never preach on tithing. Why? What's the reason why? Because he's scared of what the people would think. He's scared of what the people would think, that maybe he would lose 
you know, his position as the pastor, he would, you know, be kicked out of the church, would be voted out. Obviously, there was a false structure where, you know, they, they have basically a bridle on the pastor and just directing him and guiding him everywhere, you know, where they want him to go and to say whatever they want him to say. That is, that is the exact opposite of what a pastor is supposed to be doing. This is a commandment. He didn't say, hey, go check with your deacons whether you should preach that or not. He didn't say, hey, make sure you take a poll and find out what everybody in the church believes and then go ahead and just preach what they like. No, he said, be instant in season and out of season. So if you like it, I'm going to preach it. If you don't like it, I'm going to preach it. That's what pastors are commanded to do. So number one, preach the word. Your sermons, the style of preaching that God desires is number one, it needs to come from the Bible. Your sermons need to come from the Bible. It needs to be the Word of God that you are preaching. Number two, you need to preach the content. That, needs, that means you need to preach the positive and you need to preach the negative. I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter number 22, verse number 7. Just to show you uh, uh, the nature of man and what man desires. Just to give you an example of this. 1 Kings chapter number 22, verse number 7. A perfect example of, of heaping unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Look here with me at 1 Kings chapter number 22, verse number uh, uh, 7. It says, And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? So he's saying, isn't there a prophet of the Lord besides them that, that we might, or besides him specifically, that we might uh, uh, inquire? Or of this group of prophets that they had brought in. They brought in a bunch of prophets and, and he hears them preach and, you know, he realizes like, oh, they're just, you know, whatever it is. He realizes they're false prophets, but something, you know, isn't right with what they're preaching. So he's like, hey, isn't there a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him. Isn't there another one besides all these guys that we might ask him what he says? And then look at verse 8. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man. But notice he didn't call that guy, right? It says, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. Those are strong words, aren't they? But I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. And then he says, hey, you know, bring him in. Notice what Jehoshaphat says. So what types of, of prophets did he have there preaching only? Did he only bring in the guys just to like preach the negative messages? No. Notice when it talks about people heaping unto themselves teachers having itching ears, what types of prophets and preachers are they going to bring in? It's going to be people that are just going to tell them what they want to hear, right? That's what it talks about. It says itching ears, right? Itching ears is just after their own lust, like it says there, right? It repeats it. It's just tell me what I want to hear. I have desires, right? You're itching because you just want to hear it, right? It's just the desire to hear things that are what? Positive about yourself. Positive to you. Not, not correcting you, not negative. Why did he not like Micaiah? He says, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. He doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. What's he saying? He just preaches to me bad things. He just preaches to me bad things. Do you know what we needed to hear? Do you know what the king needed to hear? He needed to hear a negative message. Do you know what Micaiah was doing? He was preaching evil or he was preaching bad or negative things is what we would say. That's how we would word that. That's what it means, evil. Right? Ill things. He was preaching negative messages because they were true. That's why. He was preaching negative things because they were true. And you know who doesn't want to hear negative preaching the most? People that need it the most. Do you know the people that don't want to hear? Do you know who needs to hear negative preaching the most? Or all these people that are like, hey, I don't, I don't want to go to a church and just sit there and just be bashed the whole time. I don't want to go to a church and somebody just sit there and preach at me the whole time. I don't want to be preached at. You'll hear people say this type of stuff. I don't want to be preached at the whole time that I'm in there. The people that hate the negative preaching the most are usually the people that need to hear it the most. You know why? Because they're, they're just like the king here. King Ahab is who this is. They're just like King Ahab and they have sin in their life and they're avoiding the negative preaching because it bothers them because it's true and it makes them feel guilty. A lot of times people will hear this type of preaching, they'll hear negative preaching and where people are reproving and rebuking and they just, you know, they have a stiff neck, a hard heart and they oppose it. You know why? Because inwardly they know that that's the type of preaching they need. They know that what someone is saying is true. They know that whatever that person, that preacher is preaching is true and it bothers them. But let me make this point before I move on any further. We shouldn't just preach negative messages just to preach negative messages. 
We have, to, we have to build upon these points. Why should we preach negative messages? Because we're preaching the Word. We should not just try to just always preach a negative message. We should not just try to just, to just be negative or to come up with our own negative things. Or just, you know, we need to also make sure that we're not way you know, off balance over here where we're only preaching negative messages. We need to preach a moderate you know, amount of the Word of God. We need to be just preaching the Word of God moderately. We need to preach it you know, in season and out of season and all of it. We need to preach the positive and we need to preach the negative. We need to preach the Word of God. Don't just preach negative messages to preach negative messages, but preach the Word of God. Preach the truth. The next point is we need to preach all the words. All the words. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 26, verse number 2. Jeremiah chapter number 26, verse number 2. Now, there are some, specifically, we, we could point out some Baptist pastors. There are some Baptist pastors out there who preach negative messages. Most, I would say most Baptist preachers and pastors preach negative messages, especially independent fundamental Baptists. They'll preach negative messages. But you know what they won't do is they won't preach all of them. You know what they won't do is they won't preach all of the word. They'll choose and they'll pick out what they want to preach and what they don't want to preach. But we as pastors and preachers, we are supposed to preach all of God's Word. A pastor, the style of preaching, you know, that's some hard preaching right there. I'm knocking people out of their seats, right? The, the, a pastor, the style of preaching that he's supposed to preach is everything. He's supposed to preach all of the Word of God. Yes, there's positive, there's negative. And you need to preach the positive and the negative. But you know what else you need to do? You need to not only, you shouldn't just go in and pick and choose the negative. People have no problem with preaching the positive. But when you look at the style of sermons, the types of sermons, and specifically the topics and subjects that pastors preach on today, do you know what sermons are usually missing from that pastor's list? It's never the positive. You know what he doesn't preach on? Negative. Now, he may preach negative sermons, but you know what he won't do? He won't preach all of the negative topics. You're supposed to preach the Word the instant in season and out of season. That's all of it. You don't pick and choose what you want to preach. You just preach the Word. Is all of this the Word of God or not? Everything in this book. All of it is. You know what you need to be doing? You need to be preaching all of it. Look at Jeremiah. We'll see this in the book of Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 26. Look at verse number 1. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them. And then notice what he says. Diminish not a word. Now when we read this, we need to pay close attention. We need to think, what's the reason why? He emphasizes, I want you to speak all the words. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them. And then he, he follows it up with another statement. He says, diminish not a word. He said, don't even remove a word. What's the reason why he's telling him that? What would be... You know, what would be the tendency for someone to do that? I want you to put yourself in Jeremiah's shoes. Is Jeremiah sent there to preach a positive or negative message? Very negative, isn't it? Very negative. This place is going to be destroyed. You're all wicked as hell. You're being punished for your sin. It's an extremely negative message. You know what he's doing? He's supposed to go to the temple and stand at the temple where there are hundreds, probably yay, thousands of people coming in and out and worshiping God and sacrificing and doing all different types of things. And he's supposed to just stand outside and just preach this negative message. Just stand out there and just preach it. I mean, extremely, just, a, a, you know, a severely negative message. Can you imagine having to do that yourself? Would you or would you not be nervous to do something like that? Well, there's just people coming in and out and you're just standing there just preaching all this negativity. You know, thus saith the Lord, you know, uh, God is going to destroy this city, just like how Jonah was preaching all these negative messages and everything that Jeremiah had preached that, hey, we're going to be going into captivity, there's a king coming from the north, you know, just go ahead and give up. You know, because of your evil and because of your sin, just go ahead and give up right now. Do you think he wanted to preach that message? Of course not. I'm sure he was dreading it. And you know what God said? Diminish not a word. Because you know why I told him that? Because you know what the tendency for Jeremiah to, to do would be? He's going to leave some things out. What is he going to leave out? Negative things. He'd try to make it sound not as rough, not as bad, not as negative, wouldn't he? He'd try to you know, you know, trim, the, trim the message just slightly. 
so that he could gear it you know, towards the people in, in a little bit more of their liking. Try to make it taste, make it a little bit more of a palatable message, right? What do pastors today do? What do they try to do? They don't preach all the word. You know, even independent fundamental Baptists, they don't preach all of it. They pick and choose. And you know what they always leave out? They leave out the negative part. They leave out the negativity. Look over at Jeremiah 36, 20. I want you to notice that he commands this to him a couple of times. Jeremiah chapter number 36, verse number 20. <clears throat> and they went into, they went into the king, into the, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe. Watch what it says. And told all the words in the ears of the king. Now right here, this is not particularly a situation. If you look up at verse number 19, it says, Then said, said the princes unto Barak, Go hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. So they, they ended up taking that particular scroll. But Jeremiah had spoke to them, and they had gotten a hold of it and everything. And they had talked about where they were going to go you know, to preach this particular message. Now I want you to notice that it was important that he read to him all the words. All the words. Why does it keep mentioning that? Why does the Holy Spirit mention that? Because that's what God desires. God was pleased with all the words being read to the king. He wanted the king to hear everything. He wanted the king to hear everything. Do you know what God wants the people to hear? Everything. He doesn't want pastors to be picking and choosing. He wanted Jeremiah to go there and to preach everything, positive and negative. Now, did the king receive the message in this case? This is, the, this is the situation where he takes the roll afterwards. While they're in the middle of reading it, takes a penknife, it says, slices it in half, and then throws it in the fire. He didn't want to hear the message. You know what? A lot of people aren't going to hear, want to hear the message. There's a lot of people that are going to you know, uh, uh, push back when you preach on something that's negative. But you know what a preacher needs to do, a pastor needs to do? He needs to preach all of it. That is God's style of preaching. He wants you to preach the Word. He wants you to preach all the content. That's positive and negative. All of it. Not only that, make sure that it's all the words. Don't just, just positive and negative. Yeah, I got some positive here. I got some negative here. But there's a few negative sermons that I just kind of want to maybe not preach those as often. Maybe leave those out because, you know, maybe I'm not going to preach on men having long hair. Because there's a few, you know, guys in my, you know, congregation that have long hair. You know, maybe I'm going to you know, not preach on this subject because there's somebody in my congregation that doesn't like this. Or they may get angry at this. Or whatever it may be. No, you need to preach all the word. All the words. Why? Because God wants the people to hear it. It's not for the preacher. It's not for the pastor necessarily. I get edified by preaching, of course. You know, men that have went, been to preaching class and preached and everything, I'm sure you can testify to that. You know, when you stand up and you preach, you are edified as well. But you know it's primarily for Jeremiah was not told to preach all the words just for himself. It's for the people. You know who is being, you know, who is being, you know, uh, 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 gypped in that type of situation is the people. They're the ones that are not getting all the words. A lot of times our churches, you know, praise God, are this style of church is a lot different than the majority of churches where the, the members read their Bible. You know, the kids are memorizing scripture, they do things on an individual basis where each individual Christian takes responsibility. Most churches are not like that. You may get used to that, but almost no church is like that, where people are actually reading their Bible on their own, memorizing their Bible and things like that. They're not. This church does do that, but think of how bad it is for those people that attend those churches when all they're hearing is just positive messages. Don't you think that that's going to affect your Christianity? Don't you think that's going to affect the way that you look at the Bible? You know, how, you know why a, me, a sermon like this would sound so crazy to someone that has sat in that type, of, that type of preaching? Why do you think all of these Christians, all the time, when they hear... How many times have you showed maybe Bible preaching, where somebody's standing up and preaching something negative, preaching loud, preaching God's style of preaching, you showed it to somebody and they're like, that just has the wrong spirit or something. That just sounds bad. That just doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound very Christian. That doesn't sound like you know, how God would want someone to preach. Haven't you heard that many times from people? I've heard it numerous times. Why? Because all, all they've heard is this watered-down, unbiblical style of preaching. Where people aren't preaching negative messages ever. They're not preaching all of the Word. 
I've even heard people say, like, I don't think that that's something he should be preaching behind the pulpit. Well, isn't it in the Bible? Isn't he, isn't he supposed to be preaching the Bible? Like, yeah, but I don't think that that's necessarily. Even like things are like Song of Solomon or something. Whatever topic it may be. Whether it makes you uncomfortable, whatever it is. People say, I don't know if that's something you should preach behind the pulpit. A preacher should preach everything. Whether you're uncomfortable, whether you're not. That's a commandment. Preach the word. All of it. All the content. Positive, negative. And everything within that particular category. Within that particular uh, uh, content. I want you to turn to Isaiah 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, Paul preached the same way. It says in Acts chapter 20 verse 18... It says, And when they were come to him, and he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing. Now watch this. That was profitable unto you. But I've showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Does it sound like Paul was ashamed to preach the word of God? No, he said, I, held, I didn't keep anything back from you. He said, I kept back nothing. And then what does he follow up with? That was profitable unto you. Notice that if he would have kept it back, who would have hurt the most? The person that he was preaching to. The recipient of the message or the recipient of the preaching. And then notice, he follows up and says, but I've showed you and have taught you publicly. Why would he say publicly? Again, think about why the choice of words. Why would he say publicly? Why would he have to mention that it's something that he taught publicly? Because it's something that a lot of people would be ashamed of, isn't it? Say, I wasn't ashamed of it is his point. Why would he say, I taught you publicly? Because I wasn't ashamed of it. Because a lot, well, you know what people get ashamed of? Negative preaching. That's what they get ashamed of. The other thing is I want to I touch on the delivery. The delivery. Now, when I looked up, you know, what type of preaching do people want to hear? And the polls and articles that were written by, you know, people that were leaders in ministries and things like that. I mentioned to you already that people said they don't want to be bashed. They don't want to hear negative messages. But do you know what the number one thing that people said they don't like when it comes to preaching? Yelling. Exactly. They, the number one thing that everybody says across the board is they don't like yelling. They don't like people screaming. And of course they try to, they don't use yelling. They say, we don't like to be screamed at. So people say they don't like to be bashed. But number one, you know what they said they don't want to hear. What types of churches, what will stop you from attending a church? And you know what people said? They don't like to hear people screaming. They don't like to hear people yelling. You know what they're saying? I don't like to hear people lifting up their voice. I don't, like people to I don't like to hear people or to listen to someone that's raising the volume of their voice while they're preaching to me. That is a commandment to a preacher. And we look throughout the Bible, Bible preaching is where someone is yelling. They are lifting up their voice. And the word that the Bible uses is cry. Now cry today, we would refer to that as what the Bible calls weeping, like shedding tears, right? We, when we say, oh, he's crying, we're saying that he's shedding tears, right? Well, that is, is referred to by the word weep. When the Bible talks about weeping, it's talking about someone shedding tears. But when the Bible says that someone cried, it's talking about them, what we would say, yelling. It's saying that that person is lifting up their voice or they are yelling. That was a commandment from God to the preachers. God commanded the preachers to yell. And when we look at all the preachers, do you know what they're doing while they're preaching? They're yelling. They're lifting up their voice. If you don't like... To go to a church where someone's yelling, then you don't like God's style of preaching. This is God's style of preaching. How do we figure this out? We look in the Bible. How did God command the preachers to preach? You wouldn't have liked Isaiah's preaching. You would have said, I just, I can't listen to that Isaiah. He just yells too much. You wouldn't have liked Jeremiah's style of preaching. You wouldn't have liked Jesus' style of preaching. You know why? Because they were commanded to yell and they yelled when they preached. They lifted up their voice. Look at Isaiah 58 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 1. It says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Look at the emphasis in the, the, the first part, the former part of that verse on the volume of the voice of the preacher. It says, cry aloud. And then it says, spare not. What does that mean? Don't hold back. 
That's what that means. What does it mean to, to, to spare something? It means to hold something back, right? He's saying cry aloud, cry out loud, yell loud. And he says spare not. And then he says lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Now why does he say a trumpet? All throughout the Bible, trumpets are used as an analogy or they're used you know, to compare to something that is also very loud. Because trumpets are extremely loud. Why do watchmen use a trumpet? Obviously, that's not a situation where you want to take any chance where people don't hear you. So they would have a watchman that's standing on a tower. And this is a, a very critical situation and a critical job. Because what they are doing is they would be warning everyone in the city that there is, you know, uh, uh, maybe imp you know, impending danger, right? Or there's a, uh, you know, an army that's coming, that's coming to besiege them or an, an attack, right? So what they want to do is they want to make sure that everyone is aware of it. So you know what instrument that they use? Specifically a musical instrument, they would use a trumpet. Why? Because it's extremely loud. So right here, what we see is that a preacher, the way that a preacher is supposed to preach is likened unto how a, a trumpet sounds. What's the point? It's supposed to be loud. If you don't like loud preaching, if you don't like someone standing up and yelling while they preach, then you don't like God's style of preaching. Then you don't like, you know, the, the way in which Isaiah preached. The way that God commanded Isaiah to preach. He told him, cry aloud, spare not, Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And then he says, and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Is that positive or negative, by the way? That's very negative. You're supposed to be showing them their sins or their transgressions. Jonah chapter number 1, verse number 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it for their wickedness is come up before me. What did he tell Jonah to go do? He said, cry against it. When Jonah walked through that city, he was walking through that city and yelling. You know, we, we oftentimes downplay things. But when Jonah was walking through the city, remember he said, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. You have some man just walking through this city and just yelling. Yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Just yelling at the top of his lungs, just repeatedly walking through the city and yelling aloud. He was commanded to do so by God. Why did he yell? Because God commanded him to do so. Isn't it funny that people don't like the negative preaching, but also people don't like the yelling? Isn't that weird? That they don't like God's style of preaching. Isn't that, and not only is it weird, it's sad that you were to take a poll and go to people and say, hey, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Bible. I believe you know, that the Bible is God's word. And you were to say, what style of preaching would you like? Well, first off, I don't want people yelling at me. Second off, I don't want people to... Secondly, I don't want people to preach at me. I don't want people saying negative things. You know what you don't like? You don't like God's style of preaching. And what's the reason why... They're supposed to lift up their voice. Every time when you see someone lifting up their voice, almost every time, not entirely, because we're going to look at a couple other examples, but most of the time, do you know what they're doing? They're preaching a negative message. The reason why they're lifting up their voice is because the message is urgent. What did I like in, why did I say that the trumpet was uh, loud? It meant to be loud. What's the point? Because it's an urgent, important message. That's why. It's something that you must hear. You have to hear. Do you know why the preacher is supposed to stand up and to preach loudly? Because it's supposed to be important. And it's supposed to make sure that you're hearing it. Because it's something that you must hear and that you need to hear. And a lot of times, you know what the message is? It's a warning. That's why. You say, why, why were they told to lift up their voice? Well, the same reason why the trumpet, why they use the trumpet for it to be loud. Because it's an important message. You know, people today, church is not important to people. The, the Word of God is not important to people. So do you know why they don't want to hear people yelling? Because, hey, they, that puts a little bit more emphasis than what they do on the Word of God. That's why people don't think that it's that, you know, that they would like to have. That's why people say, I, wouldn't, I don't want to hear people yelling. I don't want to hear people doing that. But, you know, it's, it's funny that those same people on a Friday night would be at their kids' soccer game and would be at their, you know, maybe the, the local, you know, uh, uh, basketball game in their uh, uh, city. And you know what they'd be doing? Yelling. You know why? Because that's important to them. That's something that they seem or deem as important in their lives. Isn't that kind of weird? Isn't that kind of funny? Why do people not like hearing loud preaching? It's because that it's not important to them. 
and that the preacher's making a much bigger deal than what they like, they, than they feel as if it is. Uh, Hosea chapter 5 verse number 7, it says, They have dealt treacherously against the Lord, for they have begotten strange children. Now shall a month devour them with their portions. Blow ye the cornet in Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah. Why is that? Because it's a warning, because it's something important, because they're going to be punished. He says, cry aloud at Beth Haven after thee, O Benjamin. Why? Because it's important. It's a warning. They must hear this. They have to hear it. It's critical. We hear Jesus preaching in John chapter number 7, verse number 28. It tells us, then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. So notice when Jesus was preaching, when Jesus was walking around, you know, what was Jesus doing while he was preaching? He was yelling. He was lifting up his voice. You know what it says he did? It says that he cried. It says that he screamed. He was lifting up his voice. He was crying aloud. It says in John 7, 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, so this is within that same feast, but at the end of the feast, it says, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. What picture do you think people have of Jesus while he's preaching? The majority of what I've seen of pictures when I was in Sunday school, paintings and things like that, the most common picture that sticks out in my mind, just because it's the most common picture, is when Jesus is seated on uh, uh, the, where he's located at the Sermon on the Mount. And how do they have Jesus preaching? How does it look while Jesus is preaching? What type of you know, uh, um, atmosphere do they have? Calm, laid back, just kind of, just kind of soft, weak delivery of his preaching, right? And he's just... You know, just basically just preaching just like how you would think of like a Lutheran, right? You've probably seen how Lutherans, how Episcopalians will preach, you know, and they'll just stand up behind the pulpit and say, Thus saith the Lord. And it's just this soft, weak, weak style delivery, isn't it? You know, that's not how Jesus preached. When we're told how Jesus... Now, I'm sure there were certain messages that Jesus preached calmly. But if you've ever seen, you know, a picture of Jesus... Where it's like Jesus is like screaming. You know, his face is like, you know, no. This, does that even, doesn't that even sound awkward or odd to you? That's the, it's because you've seen all these paintings. Those things like get embedded into your mind when you see these pictures. You know, and, and visuals are something that's super hard to get out, right? You know, that's why you need to be careful of things that you put in front of your eyes. Because it's, it's like, it, it's, you know, it's infused into your brain after that. But notice that two times here, what does it say that he did? He cried. What does it mean? He yelled. He's yelling while he's preaching. And it says, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. So can you imagine being at this feast and then Jesus just stands up? Again. And he says, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He's just yelling. So that's not the picture of Jesus of what you would normally think, is it? People would be, you know, think that he stands up and say, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. That's not how Jesus preached. That's not how any of the prophets preached. That's not Bible preaching. That's not the style of Jeremiah's preaching. That's not the style of Isaiah's preaching. You know, people will look at our style of churches and they'll say, man, you look like a maniac. You look crazy. You know, uh, you know they'll, they'll take videos of you screaming and yelling and they're like, what is wrong with this guy? I've had so many. And I speak loudly virtually the whole time that I'm preaching and then I just lift up my voice a little bit more when I start screaming. But people will comment constantly. You know, even on clips. You can't say it's my whole sermon. Even on clips, they'll just they'll comment and they'll be like, you know, stop yelling so loudly. Stop screaming so much. Those same people, if they heard Jesus preach. Let's say that you just put Jesus like, but if Jesus just came back and just, you know, theoretically just got behind the pulpit and just started preaching and you uploaded it to YouTube, they'd hate it. They would hate it. Why? It's all the things that they don't like. Think about that. Then they kind of, you know, uh, 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 make the point a little bit more, demonstrate the point a little bit, you know, better. They would despise it. They would hate hearing the negativity. They would hate hearing how he's just screaming and yelling, wouldn't they? If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. That's how Jesus preached. He yelled. He screamed. He lifted up his voice while he preached. 
John 12, 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Notice, he's crying. He's lifting up his voice. He's yelling. He's preaching loudly. He's preaching loudly. That is biblical preaching. And if you don't like that style of preaching, you don't like God's style of preaching. If you don't like yelling, then you don't like Bible preaching. Micah chapter number 3, verse number 8, another point is that preaching should be bold. Preaching should be bold. And a part of being bold, what that means is that it's, it's filled with power. It's filled with judgment. Micah chapter number 3, verse number 8 says, But truly I am full of power, watch this, by the Spirit of the Lord, and of judgment, and of might, to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin. I want you to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. I want you to notice that almost every time, what type of preaching is it? The majority of the time, it's negative, isn't it? They're preaching the word, and it's negative. Not only that, it's negative. There's a lot of correction of rebuke and reproof and everything going on. But furthermore, right here, notice it says, I am filled of, I am, I'm sorry, I'm, but truly I am full of power. By the Spirit of the Lord, he says, and of judgment. Isn't that like negative? When you're, you're preaching something negative, you, wouldn't you say that you're making a judgment of something that's right and something that's wrong? It's judgment, he says, and of might. To declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Notice that he says, of might. What does it mean, might? Let's talk about power, right? If, if someone is preaching something, and they're preaching loudly, and they're preaching something negative, and they're preaching something that is, you know, that's something that would be where, where someone would say, hey, he's judging. Wouldn't you think that it would be a, a sermon that would be, uh, which I already repeated this, a powerful sermon? If it's a sermon that's negative and it's a sermon that's judging, wouldn't you think that it would be something that's powerful? Wouldn't you think that it would entail, that it would carry power behind it? You wouldn't preach a sermon that's negative that wouldn't have power. You wouldn't preach, if you had somebody that stood up and yelled, wouldn't you think that that would go along with a sermon that you would say, hey, that had power in it or that had might in it? I want to look at the mannerisms. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 6 verse number 11. Ezekiel chapter number 6, verse number 11. These last two, I want to make the same point with this. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter number 6, verse number 11. I want you to notice how all of these different commandments that are all given throughout the Bible to different preachers, different pastors, the different style of preaching, uh, uh, you know, or the different elements of the style of preaching of God's preaching, how they all go together perfectly. If you're yelling. Now, another thing, and this is something that we're going to look at right now. I'll, I'll transition into this point right now. One of the things that people, you know, maybe wouldn't like as well, and it would make perfect sense, is right here what this is uh, commanded in Ezekiel chapter number 6, verse number 11. Thus saith the Lord God. It says this. Smite with thine hand, it says, and stamp with thy foot. Now look at what style message he's preaching. And say, alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword by the famine, and by the pestilence. What style of preaching is he preaching right now? Is it positive or negative? What type of message? Extremely negative. Now I want you to notice that, was it, was it, you know, an option? Was it optional for Ezekiel to follow what is being told right here? It says, thus saith the Lord God. This is a commandment from God, isn't it? This is speaking to Ezekiel. He's been sent forth to preach a message. And notice what it says. It says, smite with thine hand. What does it mean to smite with your hand? It means to hit something. To smite something means to hit something. It would mean to hit, right? To smite. If someone in the Bible is, is, has, you know, if someone smites someone, it means that they hit them. So he's saying, smite with thine hand, right? And then he says, and stamp with thy foot. It would be like stomping is what we would say. And stomp with thy foot. Let me ask you something. Does that sound like that goes along with the style of preaching in the majority of Christian churches today? I want you to think of, you know, the, the pastor of just the, you know, the typical, the perfect, we always think of it's just this brand of Cornerstone. Cornerstone Christian Church. And the style of preaching that, that you know, I don't know what the, that guy would have his name like Chris. You know, Chris would deliver. What style of preaching would Chris deliver? I mean, he's got a glass pulpit. He definitely can't be hitting his pulpit. But, you know, he's, he would be giving like a weaker style of preaching, right? It's just all exhorting. It's just all you know, positive. Let me ask you, does smiting with your hand, I want, I want you to blend all of these things together and look at the style of preaching and how they all fit perfectly together. Can you imagine Chris 
standing up with his Sunday morning sermon. He's got his, his microphone with a little bead on the end of it, right? He's got his skinny jeans on, probably a pair of New Balances or Air Max or something like that. And he normally is wearing a flannel. Most of the time, I think, he tucks it in, kind of folds it up to about right here, you know? What style of preaching would he be doing? It'd be positive, wouldn't it? Can you imagine trying to incorporate the smiting with your hand? And stomping with your foot? Can you imagine that trying to even force that into that style message? You know why? Because they're two totally different styles of preaching. Because Cornerstone Christian Church, or, you know, uh, what's the, um, there's Elevate, but what is the one that I was like, that one time when somebody yelled it out, I was like, that sounds like a nightclub. What is it? What was it? 1122. That sounds like a nightclub. It does. It sounds like a nightclub. Like it would be downtown, in the middle of downtown, 1122 and lights and everything. That, you know, the style of preaching that 1122 is going to be having, there you will not see the pastor of 1122 smiting with his hand or stomping with his foot. Do you think that when Ezekiel was preaching this that he's just like, what is he told to say? Alas, alas for all the evil abominations. You think that that's how he's delivering his message? Alas for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel. You think that that's how he's doing it? Thus saith the Lord God, will destroy the whole city. Looks ridiculous. It doesn't go together. Do you know how he said it? Alas for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It will be destroyed, the whole city. That's Bible preaching. That is Bible preaching. If that makes you uncomfortable, man, can you imagine having to go out there and listen to Ezekiel? Can you imagine standing there when Jeremiah was... I mean, he's standing at the, the entrance of the door. Have you really pictured this? I didn't go into too much of it because I got a whole sermon to preach. Jeremiah's standing there right where people are walking in. Can you imagine having to walk past this guy? You're like, don't look at him, don't look at him, don't look at him. And he's like, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Just give up. The evil abominations. God's not accepting your sacrifice buddies like following people around. He's supposed to be preaching at the door where, where people are going into worship. And he's just yelling at people and preaching. This is Bible preaching. You know what he would be called today? All this radical Bible thumper. I would never go to that guy's church. I don't want to hear somebody yelling at me. Jeremiah, that Jeremiah prophet, he's just always bashing me. If he ever becomes a pastor, I'm never joining his church. Do you know what you could see Jeremiah doing when you read his preaching? Smiting with his hand and stomping with, with his foot. You know why? Because it fits in. Do you know what you could see Jesus doing while he's crying? Smiting with his hand and stomping with his foot. If any man hunger, let him come unto me. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Because he's crying aloud. Do you know, notice how all of these things, when you incorporate them, they paint a perfect picture. You know what it doesn't do? It doesn't fit with Chris. At 1122. It doesn't fit with his style of preaching. You know why? Because it's not God's style of preaching. But when you put all of it together, it makes perfect sense. And it, and it paints a perfect picture. And you know what the point is? Do you know what it, you know what it does when I start yelling? You know, I could tell when I, when I just a moment ago, when I was, you know, acting, you know, uh, uh, what word could you, I would delicate, soft, delicate and fragile, and effeminate, watch it. No, I'm just kidding. Effeminate, right? And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretending like Chris. And then I spoke the pulpit and I looked up and started pointing. Elliot, I think, needs to change his pants. It, you know what it did was it got a hold of everybody's attention. His face, he was laughing before and then all of a sudden he was like this. And was looking at me. That was one thing that I noticed. He was, he was staring right at me and paying attention. You notice that? He's listening to what I'm saying. You know why? Why does God want, you, want preachers to yell? Because it's important. Because I want, He wants to make sure that everyone hears and that everyone's listening. Because the message that's being preached is the Word of God. You know what it deserves? It deserves attention. Do you know what happened? When not only because I was yelling, but when I smite the pulpit, you may not be paying attention but if I hit this pulpit, you're going to perk up real quick. Do you know why? Because this is an important message. You know what somebody be telling you? What does a teacher do when everything's just in disarray? And she's like, children, listen. Listen. And they're just throwing paper airplanes. And they're just spitting spit wads and messing around. And then she's like, 
children! What is she trying to do? Get their attention. I have something important to say to you. Do you know why God said? Think about it. All is practical. Remember I said in the beginning? Why does he say smite with thy hand and stomp with thy foot? What message is he trying to get across? A negative message. It fits. But you know what else? It's important. Because it's negative, you need to make sure that you hear this. Why is it important when Jesus said, when he cried? Because obviously it's an important message. All of God's word is important. It says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Because salvation is important. Because the, the salvation of your soul, the eternal destiny of your soul is important. So Jesus stood up, it says, because he wanted to make sure that everybody saw it. Kind of like smiting with your hand. Gets your attention, doesn't it? If you're standing at a feast, guy stands up out of his seat and just starts yelling. You know what it's going to do? It's going to get your attention. But if he started walking back and forth, like Chris does on the pulpit, kind of twisting around back and forth, it's, people fall asleep in that kind of service all the time, wouldn't they? It wouldn't keep your attention. It wouldn't grab your attention in the same way. You know? If he's just walking back and forth, just kind of just real, it's like meant to put you asleep almost. Just like a calm, and that's what the kind of atmosphere that they want. Almost like he's like flipping around like he's got flip-flops on. How they go back and forth when they turn when they get to the end. It's, it's an effeminate type of manner. It's, it's meant to be soft and weak. Jesus was not soft. Jesus, to most Christians out there, Jesus is not who you think he is. He's totally different than how you think he is. And, and it, would be, it would just be so amazing if, if there was some like just maybe just a small recording for this purpose. Obviously God probably, I'm sure, wouldn't have desired that. But if, there was, if we could just have like a, like a visual of exactly how Jesus preached and just show it to people like, this is Jesus. Most people will be like, that's not the Jesus I know. That's not, that's not Jesus preaching. That's some kind of imposter. Jesus would never act like that. Jesus would never preach that way. The, we're supposed to preach plainly. I'm going to go through a couple other points real quick and I want to get to one other thing. We're supposed to preach plainly. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 verse number 7 through 9 says this, And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they have a distinction in the sounds, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, watch this, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. You know what he's saying? Speak plainly. There's a phrase one time, I used this in a, in a sermon uh, uh, past when I was preaching in Arizona, where when, they, when Saul is looking for the asses, and he goes to Samuel, Samuel, it's a, and the Bible tells you he told him plainly, like the asses are found or something like that. But it says he told him plainly. You know, that's how a prophet should speak. That's how a preacher should speak. Someone that's preaching the word of God. How did he know that? He's preaching the word of God. The Word of God is plain. That's why a lot of people don't like it. It's very plain. It's in your face, right? And it, it's just very forward. It's, it, it just it leaves no, you know, uh, there's, it makes no bones about it. People make that statement. That guy, when he speaks, he, you know, you know, he just speaks plain. That's how the Bible is, and that's how preachers are supposed to preach. They're supposed to speak and to preach plain. And clearly, and it sh they should be easy to understand. I shouldn't be after you preach trying to figure out what you believe. Even if we're talking doctrine. Like if somebody stands up and preaches on, you know, uh, the timing of the rapture, I shouldn't be like confused. Like is he saying pre, mid, you know, post? Like what does this guy believe? It should be clear because God wants you to know what his word is. He wants you to know what the Bible says. A lot of its warnings, a lot of its doctrine, he wants you to hear it and to know it and to be able to respond to it. We're not supposed to be just hearers of the word, but doers also. So how can we do things? How can we put things into practice and respond to the preaching if we don't even understand what the preacher is saying? So it's important that it be clear. A lot of that is offensive preaching. <clears throat> offensive because it's negative. The word of God is likened unto a weapon. Why? Because it's offensive. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible is offensive. It's likened unto a weapon. Not a shield, mind you. An offensive weapon. Because it's very offensive. There are things in the Bible that offend me. There are things in the Bible that offend you. You know, why? Because we're sinners and we need to be corrected. We need to be you know, uh, uh, reproved and rebuked. 
So it can be very uh, offensive. Not only that, I want to hit this point and then one other. Uh, a lot of things in the Bible, go to 1 Kings chapter number 18, verse number 27. This is one of those things that people don't understand about biblical preaching. They're very, they're very, there's a famine when it comes to biblical preaching. They're very confused about what is actually Bible preaching. A lot of things in the Bible can be crude. The Bible uses crude language. Crude is kind of like the word rude, right? When someone speaks crudely, oftentimes that person speaks plainly. And, and people would even sometimes say that it's inappropriate. That would kind of be, in a way, how crude would be interpreted. It would be something that you, something crude would be, this is a perfect example, the word piss. If you were to say that, like let's say that there's what people say mixed company or something, you have a bunch of people over your house and somebody stands up, right? And uh, you know, like where, or your son, he goes to the bathroom or something and he comes back and, you're, and then somebody asks you, what happened? He's like, oh, he had to just go take a piss. You know, somebody would say, that's kind of crude, wouldn't they? That's kind of an example of, of something being crude. This may confuse people, but the Bible, very, very often, you, is crude. And it's, it's, it has rude style language, very, very often. The style language that the Bible uses is very crude. It's not this just perfectly tailored, you know, just like eloquent in the sense of just like, it's, oh, it's for the elite style language, how you would think of that. Of the, how, the only way that, that the Bible is written is just for the, how the scholars would speak and... That's not the style of the Bible. Even Paul said in 2 Corinthians eleven six, 6, But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But we have been throughly made manifest among you in all things. I want you to look at the, the prophet Elijah here in 1 Kings. Look at 1 Kings chapter number 18, verse number 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey. Or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. So notice that Elijah here, this is the face-off between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And all these prophets are here and they're, and they're praying to Baal and they're saying, whoever sends fire you know, and burns up their altar and their sacrifice, he's the Lord. So we're going to find out who is the Lord. So they get their altar, they get their sacrifice ready, right? Elijah gets his ready, and, and even to take it a step further, Elijah like pours water in this like trench around the, the sacrifice and around the altar, pours water all over the sacrifice, it's like as moist as could possibly be, and then they sit there and he allows them to go first. And notice it says until noon, it says, and it came to pass at noon, so all the way until noon, it says that they were crying aloud. So from the morning all the way to noon, so for hours, they're just crying aloud and yelling out, saying, Baal, we beseech thee, Baal, you know, send fire to, to we offer this sacrifice unto thee, humbly, Baal. And they're just you know, continually yelling out. And Elijah's just like sitting back, just like waiting. You know, can you imagine? He's just sitting here, and he's just like... Just like, he's watching these guys yelling out. He's just like walking around. And then like eventually at noon after they've been doing this for like four hours, get the picture. What I'm doing right here fits perfectly. He says to them, cry aloud. You know, cry a little louder, he's saying. Why? For he is a God. He's saying like, hey, he's all the way in heaven, right? Cry aloud for he is a God. He says, either he is talking. Maybe he's talking to somebody. Either he is talking or he is pursuing. Maybe he's like going after something. He's trying to go get something. Maybe he left for a few minutes, right? He's pursuing something. He is pursuing, he says, uh, or he is on a journey. Maybe he went on a journey. That's why he can't hear you. He is in a journey. And then it says, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. So he's waiting and then, you know, all of a sudden he just has had enough. And then he just walks over to them while they're just crying out loud, you know, under Baal. And he's like, why don't you cry a little louder? For he is a God, you know. Maybe he is, maybe he is uh, talking, or he is pursuing, or he's on a journey. And then he's like, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. Like, God is taking a nap, and maybe the reason why he's not answering you is because he's asleep, and that's why he's not sending fire. What's he doing? It says Elijah mocked them. 
Elijah was making fun of them. This is, Elijah is like one of the greatest men of God in the entire Bible. He is, he is easily top five greatest men of God. The miracles that he does, God took him to heaven. God, and that only happened with one other person. God took him to heaven. When the prophets come back, everybody agrees at least one of them is Elijah. You know, he's going to be one of the men that come back. You look at just how he's fed, how he's taken care of. He's mentioned in the Bible and they're like, who's Jesus? Well, I mean, he's Elias or maybe Jeremiah. So they even thought maybe he's, Jesus was Elijah. Why? Elijah was a great man of God. You know how he operated? He mocked false prophets. He made fun of false prophets. He mocked them and made fun of them. And that's funny. My daughter and I, like a few years back, we would always laugh about that. And, and, and we would like say that about like other, you know, religions and stuff like that. And make fun of them the same way that Elijah did. Maybe he's sleeping and he must be awake. Can you imagine watching this? It doesn't fit in with what a lot of people see. Would you ever watch like one of these Bible stories? And you think that they would have Elijah walk over to him and mock him? And like make fun of him? Like the prophets of Baal are over here and they're just like, Hey, maybe you need to yell a little louder so you can wake him up from his sleep. Now, is that at all how you imagine this? Not even at all, but that is Bible preaching. So you say, hey, I don't think you should mock people or make fun of them. I'm just using a passage where it actually uses the word mocked. Where it actually says he mocked them. There's tons of other times where prophets mock people. And they're like making fun of and laughing at the stupidity of false prophets and things that they're doing. God says that he mocks people. Elijah's making fun of them. So if I were to like, what would people say if I made fun of Joel Osteen? If I mock like Joel, like I wrote this comment one time on this picture of Joyce Meyer. And uh, I can't remember how Jessica saw it. Maybe she like got into my phone or something and I had a notification like, I was just scrolling through Facebook. I saw this, this picture of Joyce Meyer, and she's, like, smiling. And I was, like, something. I don't remember what it was, but I was, like, I wrote something on there about her looking like the Joker. She's got this huge smile, and she's got all this, you know, makeup on. And it got, like, tons of likes, but, you know, it got a lot of comments. I kept getting notifications from that stupid thing, because everybody's, like, bam, bam, bam. Not all of them were people liking it, though. A lot of people were, like, angry faces. And you know what a lot of people commented, the people that put the angry faces, you know what they said? It's not very Christian of you. It's not very nice of you. Oh, you call yourself a Christian? And people were like creeping my profile like, you're supposed to be a pastor? Because it says pastor of Valley Baptist Church. You're supposed to be a pastor? That's, it is biblical to mock false prophets. I'm not just trying to justify what I do. We do this because the Bible does this. I preach the way that I preach because that's the way the Bible says to preach. I yell because the Bible says yell. I preach everything in the Bible whether you like it or whether you don't because God commands me. Hey, there are people actually out there that actually do care about what the Bible says. Whether you understand it or not, whether you've been so numb to people out there just preaching what they want to preach or trimming the message or preaching the style of preaching that everybody wants, there are still people out there and pastors that pray to God for boldness and pastors that desire to stand up and to preach everything in the Bible. Hey, the tendency is there. Hey, don't preach on that. The tendency is there to, hey, preach on things that people will like. Preach on things that, you know, gets views on YouTube or that will keep members and things like that. Yeah, the tendency's there. You know what God says? Preach the word. You know, the tendency's there for everyone to give into the flesh and to do what you would need to do to, to maybe grow the church or things like that that would be important in certain areas. Of course, that's important. And how do you escalate it? Why do people, great men of God, fold in situations? You know, they stop preaching to grow the church, to preach things that people would like, to be popular and everybody like you and keep coming to the church. So it's like, I'm not trying to justify things. It's biblical to mock false prophets. There are people out there that really love the Lord and, and strive to love the things that he loves and hate the things that he hates. And like David said, I hate every false way. I hate hearing false doctrine. I hate hearing, I hate seeing Jehovah's Witnesses out there. I hate seeing women preachers standing up and preaching false doctrine and preaching false things. I hate that. Even if a woman's standing up and preaching the Bible correctly, it's commanded against. It's forbidden according to God's Word. I hate seeing things like that. It makes me even more angry that she preaches a false gospel. She preaches all types of garbage. She deserves to be mocked, you prophet of Baal. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be popular. 
That's not what I'm trying to do. I don't care whether people like me even slightly. That's not on my radar. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm wanting to preach the Bible. I'm wanting to please God. That's what I'm wanting to do. I'm wanting to do... I, you know what I want? I want God to be... I want to preach God's style of preaching. That's what I want. I want to preach the way that God wants me to preach. Go to Matthew 23 and let's end there. Matthew chapter number 23. I want to just go through... I want to read this. I'm not going to have time because I've went on a little bit too long already. But I'm not going to have time to go through this. But I want you to look at how Jesus preached. Matthew chapter number 23. <clears throat> Verse number 1, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Mind you, the Pharisees are sitting right here. We'll figure that out here in just a minute. So he just starts pipes up while the Pharisees are right here. He just starts preaching about the Pharisees right to their face. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be, call and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But... Be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Now I wanted to end with this, and I want to put this in your mind real quick. But like I said, I can't uh, uh, illustrate, I can't go into this point to illustrate it too much. Everything that we saw of God's style of preaching. I want you to imagine that here of what's being spoken and what's being said. Does it fit? The way that Chris at Cornerstone preaches? Does it fit the way that the Lutheran priest preaches when he stands up and they read their liturgical you know, phrase or whatever for the week? They go over the liturgy and how they just stand up real calmly and you know, everything is just, you know, uh, just meticulous and super clean and you know, they set the, the cracker on, the, on this pillow and people come down and give it to them. Hey, y'all, my Lord. And go back up. That is, it's just, that's not the type of overly tailored type of Christianity. You know what this fits? Someone screaming and yelling. Smiting with their hand and stomping with their foot and preaching a negative message. Look at what it says. But woe unto you. That's a curse. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. You think he's saying, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Do you think that that's how he's preaching? Now, I've seen things of even Matthew 23 where he's preaching against the lawyers. He's preaching against the Pharisees. What do they do? You know how they have him preaching? Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. He is not just speaking to these people. There's a reason why the King James Bible translators put an explanation point there. It's obvious and clear. There's no, there's no interpreting. He's yelling. No one in the Bible, he's not standing up there saying, Woe unto thee, but saying it like this. Woe unto thee. Scribes, Pharisees, lawyers... He's yelling at them. He's lifting up his voice at them. If he's lifting up his voice just to say, you know, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink, he's yelling when he's saying this. Look at what he says further. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. These are strong, stinking words. This is probably the strongest sermon, either this or Ezekiel 16 in the entire Bible. When God has Ezekiel preaching and he's like, just like calling Israel a whore and a harlot like every other verse. It is super strong. And like, like describing her in like the, just the most disgusting way, Israel. It's like just the most worthless piece of garbage is like how he's speaking to Israel. 
Useless. That's how, you know, a, a whore would be someone that is of little to no value. That's what he's trying to describe in that situation. And look at how he's saying here. This is a strong sermon. Child of hell. That's strong. Look at verse 16. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain in a gnat and swallow a camel, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye, blow, ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gather, gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That is the biggest butt ripping I have ever heard in my life. That's hard. I'm about to lose my voice here. That's hard to even keep up with the entire time while he's just screaming. Can you imagine sitting in a seat and somebody just coming up and preaching these words to you? Can you imagine just standing in the temple? You're like minding your own business. And you're a Pharisee, right? To put yourselves in those shoes. And then all of a sudden he stands up and he like begins. Like, it's funny like he's God in the flesh. But you still think of like how this took place. He just like walks in. And it's like then spake Jesus to the multitude and his disciples saying. So he like walks in and he's like. The scribes and the Pharisees. Like he looks over at them. And then he just starts preaching about them. That's the Jesus of the Bible. Think about that. That's how he was. And there was a lot of mocking going on there too. You could see a lot of facetious, like sarcastic statements. Like, hey, you tithe. You're talking about how he mocks on them like them, they're tithing on like every little piece of mint. Like you got like this one little, like, you know, little bud of mint, right? The little plant of mint. And they're like, ah, 10% of that. He's like trying to point out how petty they are. It's meant to be facetious and to like mock them. You know, this is Bible preaching. How I just preached that. 
How do you think, who do you think would deliver that message better? Chris or Pastor Baker? Seriously, think about the, the delivery. It's not the same. What is Bible preaching? I want to preach how Jesus preached. Amen. Honestly. I want to hear that. You know why? Because God knows best. This type of message, you know the types of message that Chris preaches, he couldn't yell. Think about that. That's what I'm doing for you in this whole sermon. I'm putting it all for you together. Why are the mannerisms there? Why is the content mostly negative? You know, the smiting with your hand, stomping with your foot goes with a negative message, doesn't it? You know what else goes with it? Lifting up your voice. You know, you know correcting someone, preaching judgment. You know, boldness doesn't go with that type of like false humility. That's what all of these like, these like the cornerstone church, it's like this overly pathetic false humility. It's just where it's fake and it's phony. You know, this is biblical preaching. I want a preacher to preach how Jesus preached. And notice I read it that way to demonstrate to you that's, that's God style preaching. I wanted to end here with the, with the epitome of that. We saw God like commanding people, preach the word, instant, in season, out of season. He told Isaiah, cry aloud, spare not. He's telling him, you know, preach negative messages. He said, he's telling Ezekiel, smite with your hand and stomp with your foot. He told Jeremiah, preach all the words. Don't leave anything out. That's God commanding. But then God's com God comes and he's born. You know what he did? He did all those things. When he preached, that's God style preaching. That's the way you are to preach. And the last thing I want to say real quickly is some people say, hey, you know, well, that was, that was just for the prophets. You're not a prophet. Number one, everybody preaches that way. Number one. Number two, they're meant to be in samples unto us. They're supposed to be our examples or our in samples. Not only did the prophets preach that way also, but the apostles preached that way. Look at some of the messages that Paul preached. Look at some of the things that Paul said. Look at some of the messages Peter preached. Look at how Peter standing there and ripping the Jews, a new one. You know, look at all of these things. And then the, we see the command there, preach the word. Not only that, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is how we find out how we're supposed to preach. Jesus came to be an example unto us. He's the chief shepherd. And we should try to follow his examples. And all shepherds and all pastors should stand up. You know what kind of preaching we need? God's style preaching. Jesus is preaching. Isaiah's preaching. Jeremiah's preaching. Elijah's preaching. You know what? Sometimes it's crude. Sometimes it's hard to swallow. It's a big pill. Sometimes it's, it can be irritating and annoying. I understand that. I've sat there and listened to it. But it's God's style preaching. We should desire to hear and have the right heart. God's style preaching. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your example, dear Lord. We thank you uh, for just correcting us and uh, uh, pricking us in the heart with the word of God. I ask you that you would help me to be a good pastor to preach what you would want me to preach, to care for those uh, that are the sheep in this church. I ask you that you would be with us and guide us and direct us. Dear Lord, I ask you that you would uh, 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 be with our church, help us to grow, dear Lord God, and uh, help us to reach out and, and help our main focus to be reaching the lost and preaching the gospel. We love you so much. Please be with the Yates family as they travel back to this day, Lord, and that you would keep them safe. And we thank you so much for the time that we got to spend with them. We love you so much. And just be with us the rest of the day and bless the service to come. And also be with Brother Eric. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.